Excuse me, little dog. Hi, right, guys. <clears throat> well, we have found ourselves with a gray and gloomy morning. A gray and gloomy Monday morning here. And the collapse of everything at uh, Bugs in a Jar Farm. And uh, I don't know where this battery is so I'm not sure today's chronicle of the collapse will make it to the end so let's dive right into it from those lefties over there at Common Dreams. I have uh, read a few articles from this fellow before I actually have interviewed uh, this fellow Michael T. Clare, K-L-A-R-E I will put the link to the interview with Michael from 2018 for those of you who want to find out more about who this guy is. But uh, real quickly, who is Michael? Do they even tell us who Michael is? Michael T. Clare is the five college professor of peace and world security studies at Hampshire College in <clears throat> Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, his newest book, Race, The Race for What's Left, the Global, the Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources. His other books include Rising Powers, Shrinking Planet, The New Geopolitics of Energy, and Blood and Oil. The Danger and Consequences of America's Growing Dependence on Imported Petroleum. Anyway, so this man is not a clueless moron. And he has been thinking for years about collapse. And now I cannot get back to where I was. So now since I, I, I clicked on that and cannot click back to the story, I'm just going to have to go all the way back to Common Dreams. And there's actually a lot in Common Dreams. Um, this this weekend edition so uh, probably the battery is going to run out while I'm trying to get back to where I should be with one uh, back arrow. Uh, oh well guys maybe we're not going to have a chronicle of the collapse today because I just had to punch that button and, but wow, I see all kinds of stuff on Common Dreams that I could do a chronicle of if we can't get back to Michael Clare. And I'm thinking maybe we can't. Ah, I do not believe it. We are back on track, and now the battery will be sure to conk out. Uh, okay. <clears throat> And I'm going to put the link on here since now the battery is going to conk out. And I will also put the link over to my interview with Michael. But what is on Michael's mind this week? He is asking the question, is industrial society on the verge of collapse? The events of this summer suggest we are already all too close to the edge of the kind of systemic failure experienced so many centuries ago by the Mayans, the ancient Pueblans, and the Viking Greenlanders. <clears throat> okay, spell this out, Michael. In his 2005 bestseller, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, geographer Jared Diamond focused on past civilizations that confronted 
severe climate shocks, either adapting and surviving or failing to adapt and disintegrating. Among those were the Puebloan culture of Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, the ancient Mayan civilization of Mesoamerica, and the Viking settlers of Greenland. Such societies, having achieved great success, imploded when their governing elites failed to adopt new survival mechanisms to face radically changing climate conditions. Bear in mind that, for their time and place, the societies Diamond studied supported large, sophisticated populations. <clears throat> I'm not sure. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure I agree with Michael and uh, Jared Diamond that we can count the Chaco Canyon civilization. But anyway, um, he throws that one in there. But of course, Mayan civilization is believed to have supported a population of more than 10 million people at its peak between 80, 250, and 900, while the Norse Greenlanders established a distinctively European society around 81,000 in the middle of a frozen wasteland. Still, in the end, each collapsed utterly and their inhabitants either died of starvation, slaughtered each other, or migrated elsewhere, leaving nothing but ruins behind. The question today is, will our own elites perform any better than the rulers of Chaco Canyon, the Mayan Heartland, and Viking Greenland? As Diamond argues, each of those civilizations arose in a period of relatively benign climate conditions when temperatures were moderate and food and water supplies adequate. In each case, however, the climate shifted wrenchingly, bringing persistent drought or, in Greenland's case, much colder temperatures. Although no contemporary written records remain to tell us how the ruling elites responded, the archaeological evidence suggests that they persisted in their traditional ways until disintegration became unavoidable. These historical examples of social disintegration spurred lively discussion among my students when, as a professor at Hampshire College, I regularly assigned collapse as a required text. Even then, a decade ago, many of them suggested that we were beginning to, to face severe climate challenges akin to those encountered by earlier societies and that our contemporary civilization also risked collapse if we failed to take adequate measures to slow global warming and adapt to its inescapable consequences. But in those discussions, which continued until I retired from teaching in 2018, our analyses seemed entirely theoretical. Yes, contemporary civilizations might collapse, but if so, not any time soon. Five years later, it is increasingly difficult to support such a relatively optimistic outlook, not only does the collapse of modern industrial civilization appear ever more likely, but the process already seems underway. <clears throat> so what are the precursors of collapse? 
when do we know that a civilization is on the verge of collapse? In his now almost 20-year-old classic, Diamond identifies three key indicators or precursors of imminent dissolution. A persistent pattern of environmental change for the worse, like long-lasting droughts. Signs that existing models of agriculture or industrial production were aggravating the crisis. And an elite failure to abandon harmful practices and adopt new means of production. At some point, a critical threshold is crossed and collapse invariably follows. Today, it is hard to avoid indications that all three of those thresholds of collapse are being crossed to begin with, on a planetary basis, the environmental impacts of climate change are now unavoidable and worsening by the year. To take just one among innumerable global examples, the drought afflicting the American West has now persist persisted for more than two decades leading scientists to label it a mega-drought, exceeding all recorded dry spells in breadth and severity. As of August 2021, 99% of the U.S. west of the Rockies was in drought, something for which there is no modern precedent. The recent record heat waves in the region have only emphasized this grim, this grim reality. The American West mega drought has been accompanied by another indicator of abiding environmental change. The steady decline in the volume of the Colorado River, the region's most important source of water, the Colorado River Basin supplies drinking water to more than 40 million people <clears throat> in the United States. And according to economists at the University of Arizona, <clears throat> it is crucial to $1.4 trillion of the U.S. economy. All of that <clears throat> is now at severe risk due to increased temperatures and diminished precipitation, the volume of the Colorado River is almost 20% below what it was when this century began, and as global temperatures continue to rise, that decline is likely to worsen. <clears throat> The most recent report of the IPCC <clears throat> offers many examples of such negative climate alterations globally, as do the latest headlines. It is obvious, in fact, that climate change is permanently altering our environment in an ever more disastrous fashion. It is also evident that diamonds second precursor to collapse, the refusal to alter agricultural and industrial methods of production which only aggravate or, in the case of fossil fuel consumption, simply cause the crisis, is growing ever more obvious. At the top of any list would be a continuing reliance on oil coal, and natural gas, the leading sources of the greenhouse gases now overheating our atmosphere and oceans. Despite all of the scientific evidence linking fossil fuel combustion to global warming and the promises 
and the promises of governing elites to reduce the consumption of those fuels. For example, under the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015, their use continues to grow. According to a 2022 report produced by the International Energy Agency, global oil consumption, given current government policies, will rise from 94 million barrels per day in 2021 to an estimated 102 million barrels by 2030 and then remain at or near that level until 2050. Coal consumption, though expected to decline after 2030, is still rising in some areas of the world. The demand for natural gas only recently found to be dirtier than previously imagined is projected to exceed 2020 levels in 2050. The same 2022 IEA report indicates that the energy-related emissions of carbon dioxide, the leading component of greenhouse gases, will climb from 19.5 billion <clears throat> metric tons in 2020 to an estimated 21.6 billion tons in 2030 and remain at about that level until 2050. Emissions of methane, another leading greenhouse gas component, will continue to rise thanks to the increased production of natural gas and for all kinds of of other reasons. <clears throat> there are many other ways in which societies are now perpetuating behavior that will endanger the survival of civilization, including the devotion of ever more resources to industrial scale beef production. <clears throat> that practice consumes vast amounts of land, water, and grains that could be better devoted to less profligate <clears throat> vegetable production. Similarly, many governments continue to facilitate the large-scale production of water-intensive crops through extensive irrigation schemes despite the evident decline in global water supplies that is already producing water, widespread shortages of drinking water in places like Iran. Finally, today's powerful elites are choosing, are choosing to perpetuate practices known to accelerate climate change and global devastation. Among the most egregious, the decision of top executives of the ExxonMobil Corporation, the world's largest and wealthiest privately owned oil company, to continue pumping oil and gas for endless decades after their own scientists warned them about the risk of global warming and affirmed that Exxon's operations would only amplify them. As early as the 1970s, Exxon scientists predicted <clears throat> that the firm's fossil fuel products could lead to global warming with, quote, dramatic environmental effects before the year 2050, yet, as has been well documented, Exxon officials responded by investing company funds and casting doubt on climate change research, even financing think tanks focused on climate <coughs> denialism. Uh, 
or consider China's decision, even as it was working to develop alternative energy sources to increase its combustion of coal, the most intense the most carbon intense of all fossil fuels in order to keep their factories and air conditioners humming during periods of increasingly extreme heat. All such decisions have ensured that future floods, fires, droughts, heat waves, you name it, will be more intense and prolonged. In other words, the precursors to civilizational collapse and the disintegration of modern industrial society as we know it, not to speak of the possible deaths of millions of us, are already evident. Worse yet, numerous events this very summer suggest that we are witnessing the first stages of just such a collapse. Let's see if my battery has collapsed. Unbelievably, my battery has not collapsed. And so then what uh, Michael Clare does is he goes through the laundry list of the apocalyptic summer of 2023, the apocalyptic summer of 2023, and goes through that uh, dead horse beating. Um, talking about how uh, <clears throat> you know this summer, as long as you don't live in the Finger Lakes of New York how the, uh, I like what he says about how by now Canada has abandoned any hope of controlling a significant per percentage of the fires raging in remote areas of the country and is simply allowing them to burn themselves out. Uh, Were this a one-time event, you could certainly say that Canada still remains an intact functioning society, but given the likelihood that the number and extent of wildfires will only increase in the years ahead as temperatures continue to rise, Canada, hard as it might be to believe, can be said to be on the verge of becoming a failed state, you know, when one of the, one of the indicators of a failed state is that, you know, the central government elites can no longer guarantee the safety of their own citizens on their own turf. Uh, and he looks over there. Uh, Anyway, let's jump ahead and get to the bottom line. If my battery will hold out for three more paragraphs, wrap it up, Michael Clare. <clears throat> Half a dozen years ago, when I last discussed Jared Diamond's book with my students, we spoke of the ways civilizational collapse could still be averted through concerted action by the nations and peoples of the world. Little, however, did we imagine anything like the summer of 23. It's true that much has been accomplished in the intervening years. Yes, the percentage of electricity provided by renewable sources globally has, for example, risen significantly, and the cost of those sources has fallen dramatically. Yes, many nations has, have also taken significant steps to reduce their carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. Still, 
global elites continue to pursue strategies that will only amplify climate change, ensuring that in the years to come, humanity will slide ever closer to worldwide collapse. When and how we might slip over the brink into catastrophe is impossible to foresee. But the events of this summer suggest we are already all too close to the edge of the kind of systemic failure experienced so many centuries ago by the Mayans, the ancient Puebloans, and the Viking Greenlanders. The only difference is that we may have no place else to go. Call it, if you want, Collapse 2.0. Thank you, Michael Clare, <laughs> for kicking off another Monday morning of doom and gloom. <clears throat> I am getting hungry, and uh, I need to go uh, add my own two cents worth to the collapse of a planet while I still can. And then I hear something about a mouse in the wall of one of my tiny houses. Get out there and and enjoy uh, and enjoy whatever the summer of 2023 while you still can. My guys, don't believe it. Battery survived. What do you think, little dog? Are you? thinking about the precursors of collapse. <laughs>